Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series in which we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the Party Time Precon from Battle for Baldur's Gate and its face commander, Nalia de Arnis, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what precon upgrade from Battle for Baldur's Gate we'll be covering next. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Nelia de Arnis is a 3-3 human rogue that costs 1, a white and a black, with the following abilities. We may look at the top card of our library at any time. We may cast Cleric, Rogue, Warrior, and Wizard spells from the top of our library. At the beginning of combat on our turn, if we have a full party, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature we control, and those creatures gain death touch until end of turn. Looking more in-depth into her core stats, Nylia is packing a relatively low CMC, a typical stat block for her cost, and a series of party-focused abilities that both help us assemble a party faster and making our entire board bigger and deadlier once the full party has been assembled. Taking a closer look at her first two abilities first, it's quite simply a future sight that's limited only to party members, which as it turns out is still quite powerful. The ability to play creatures off the top of a library is quite a potent one after all that our colors normally don't have access to, effectively turning our top deck into an extra card in hand that replaces itself when cast. And even the party-only limitation not being too severe since the pool of creatures it gives us access to has some very powerful entrance, even without taking into consideration our commander's other party synergies. Speaking of party synergies, Nylia's last ability is the payoff to her first, permanently growing our board once the full party has been assembled and turning all our creatures into kill spells during combat to make them a nightmare to block. Our colors already have a solid selection of plus one plus one counter distribution and support to both supplement and take advantage of the counters our commander will be distributing to our creatures, as well as plenty of first striking and double striking creatures that can take advantage of the offensive death strike to safely trade in combat, and creatures with menace to force our opponents to two for one if they want to block our creatures. So as we can see, Nylia de Arnis is a party-focused commander through and through. Her abilities making her perfect to quickly scout out party members from our deck, and once the party has been assembled, providing our entire board with steady growth and offensive deadliness. Which is why in this precon upgrade we'll be focusing on getting as much value out of our commander's abilities as possible, aiming to both improve the quality and quantity of our party members to ensure our commander hits the best of them off the top as frequently as possible. On the quality side of things, the core build already has a respectable number of high quality party members to help both keep our board intact and grow it. So we'll be supplementing these numbers even more to make our board even more resilient and grow even faster, as well as adding in party members that can reanimate themselves or others to ensure that a small thing like death won't keep the party apart for long. Then looking at the quantity side of things, we'll be adding even more party members to the build so that Nylia has even more targets to hit off the top with her first ability. The base build already has a hefty 44 creatures in the main deck, but we'll be beefing up that number even further to a whopping 54 party members instead, ensuring that more than half our deck is castable off the top with our commander. Of course, that means we'll be needing to cut a decent number of non-creature spells to make room for more party members, but luckily we have access to plenty of party members whose abilities can still be used to fulfill our core stats without suffering from inconsistency. So let's post this quest and have Nylia gather a party to complete it for us. She's quite the skilled adventurer after all, having been on the very party that defeated the powerful wizard Arensius alongside the legendary Garion's ward themselves, and her skill is only surpassed by her compassion for those less fortunate. So whether it be wizards, undead, dragons, or upstart planeswalkers, we can be assured that the job will get done and that the coin will be going to those who need it most. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and playstyle, let's look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. Going over our kept creatures first, we'll begin by breaking them down by the class they belong to in the party. Starting off with our clerics first, Mother of Runes and Eight and a Half Tails keep their spots by providing us with repeatable targeted removal protection for our commander and other party members to keep our party in one piece for longer, as the selfless spirit who protects our entire board by sacking itself but in the meantime can be used as an evasive body to grow with our commander and who we can easily bring back upon death with our reanimation effects to further protect our board. Glorious Protector also gets to keep its spot, its flash allowing us to play it off the top on our opponent's turns to grant it pseudo haste, and its ETB effect protecting our entire board from any type of wipe which would otherwise set us back significantly. Frontline Medic stays in as well, its AoE indestructibility granting synergizing perfectly with our commander's AoE death touch, ensuring any attacks we make will either get through or cause heavy casualties to our opponent's boards while we suffer none of our own. 
Then switching gears from Protection to Resurrection, we'll be keeping both Order of White Clay and Solemn Doom Guide. The former allowing us to permanently reanimate our lower CMC party members, and the latter allowing us to temporarily reanimate any of our party members thanks to Unearth, both making it easier to assemble and keep a full party even if we have to drag up our party members' bodies from the bin. Quickly running down the remainder of our kept clerics, Archpriest of Iona keeps its spot by providing an incremental power boost to itself as we assemble our party and eventually a targetable damage boost and evasion once the full party comes online. Micaeus the Lunark remains as a repeatable source of plus one plus one counters that makes great use of our commander's counter distribution to grow the rest of our board even faster. High Priest of Penance makes it in as a solid source of repeatable removal that makes it difficult for our opponents to block it without losing their permanence. Malakir Blood Priest carries over as a solid party payoff to top off our life totals while draining the rest of the table. And Bygone Bishop takes up our last kept cleric slot by providing us with a source of continual draw in the form of clues as our low CMC party members come into play, of which we have many. The warriors that made the grade are then up next, starting off with the new Harper Recruiter and Seasons Engineer. The former being an excellent source of card advantage as it swings in to help us drop our party members even faster, and the latter's introduction of the initiative into the game, counter distribution and draw thanks to explore and offensive protection making it a great source of both value and offensive support for our build. The attack-focused warriors, squad commander, and Giselle Goldmane also managed to stay in. The former ZTB token creation and AoE offensive indestructibility and battle cry being solid party payoffs that work very well with our commander's AoE counter distribution and death touch. And the latter's AoE pump, while somewhat expensive to activate, is repeatable and takes advantage of our wide creature base to alpha strike our opponents very consistently, providing a minimum of plus four plus four with just our party members in play and only getting better from there. Then running down the rest of our warrior holdovers, Bloodsoak Champion keeps its spot by being a highly expendable warrior that, if blocked, will usually trade up thanks to Death Touch, then come right back into play if we manage to deal any damage on our main two to keep our party intact. Mindblade Render remains since it turns the 20 potential warriors in our deck into sources of card advantage, including itself, and Solemn Recruit rounds out our warrior carryovers by possessing both Double Strike to work alongside our commander's Death Touch, and growing itself as we suffer losses, enabling it to grow out of control surprisingly quickly. Our kept wizards are then up next, with Deep Gnome Terramancer of course keeping its spot by being a powerful source of land-based ramp in white that takes full advantage of other colors' superior ramp to not only keep up but surpass them. Rumor Gatherer and Grim Harrowspec staying in as reliable and repeatable sources of card draw as our creatures ETB and die off respectively. Even Mind Sensor carrying over as an evasive body that hoses any deck searching our opponents may attempt. And Felisa Fang of Silver Quill wraps up our wizard holdovers by being able to distribute additional counters thanks to Mentor, and turning all our counter laden creatures into ticking time bombs that will flood the board with evasive tokens upon their demise, actively de incentivizing our opponents from removing our creatures or wiping our board. Reaching our kept rogues, the only one that managed to hold on to its spot was Grim Hireling, as we'd rather draw into any other party member type since we always have access to a rogue from our command zone, but it's on damage treasure generation for our creatures and ability to turn that treasure into non-destruction based removal being too good to pass up. And finally, reaching the wild cards that can be any class in our party, Baraka's party leader earns his spot by being both a flexible way to enable a full party and a powerful party payoff to pile on the damage and ramp us even harder as we assemble them, and the changelings changeling outcast and mirror entity stay in as well by easily fulfilling any role our party may be missing, and whose unblockability and AoE pump work nicely to get additional damage in as we grow them or our boards. Skipping over kept instance, as none from the core build carried over, we'll move straight to our kept sorceries where the wipes stick together and austere command both made it in, each allowing us to level our opponent's boards while at least keeping some of our boards intact, whether that be our party members or low CMC creatures, which we have plenty of both. Enchantment Keepers are then up next, with Black Market Connections being the only one that made the grade, passing with Flying Colors as a continual source of ramp draw and changeling tokens to fill our core stats and party goals, and whose life cost isn't too bad since this build has ways to gain life back to help take the edge off. Proceeding to the kept artifacts, we start off with the Mana Rocks, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Orzhov Signet, and Talisman of Hierarchy, all of which help us speed up or fix our mana base to get the mana we need to assemble our party members from our hand or from the top of our decks. Then for our last two kept artifacts, Multiclass Baldrick makes it in as a solid party payoff that distributes lots of powerful keywords, alongside solid damage protection to make the death touch our commander provides even more potent, as does Maskwood Nexus to provide us with a way to fix our party ratio by turning all our creatures into changelings, as well as giving us a mana sink to produce additional tokens to grow our board state. Skipping over walkers, since none came in the base build, we'll move straight to our kept land base. With Command Tower staying in as a reliable source of mana from our commander's color identity, Path of Ancestry keeping its spot by tapping for both our colors and also tacking on a free scry as we summon one of the 30 creatures in our deck that are considered humans or rogues, Tainted Field and Temple of Silence making the cut as solid dual lands to help fix our colors, and Myriad Landscape holding onto its spot thanks to the ramp it provides us access to from our land slot. 
Then for our kept utility lands, Bajuga Bog stays in as a solid source of graveyard hate from the land slot to help us combat against graveyard-focused builds. Muta Vault remains as an emergency way to fill our party requirements from the land slot. Vault of the Archangel keeps its spot by being an excellent source of AoE life gain that works well with our large creature base to help stabilize our life totals. And Castle Locked Wayne and War Room then close out our utility land holdovers by providing us with decent repeatable card draw from the land slots to keep our hands nice and full without having to cut into our party members. And finally, 9 Plains and 10 Swamps make it in as our basics to round out our mana base. That leaves us with a final tally of 67 cards including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 33 cards to replace. So now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. Starting off with our creature upgrades, we'll be looking to increase both the quantity and quality of our party members in the Cleric, Warrior, and Wizard categories to maximize our chances of hitting them off the top of our deck with our commander's ability and getting us the best value out of them while doing so. Beginning with our Cleric upgrades first, the far too expensive Pontiff of Blight will lose its spot to Giver of Runes, who gives us another manaless way to protect our commander and other party members from removal, or alternatively allowing them to bypass blockers and trade more effectively, and the unimpressive Priest of Ancient Lore and flexible but overcosted Irregular Cohort and Valiant Changeling being replaced with Benevolent Bodyguard, Vigilant Martyr, and Allenbach Escort, all of which can sacrifice themselves to keep our more important party members alive, and can take advantage of our repeatable reanimation effects to come back into play so they can do so again. Next, we'll be replacing the non-creature Thwart the Grave, the extra rogue Aganti Lord of Luxury, and the out-of-place draw source Corpse Augur. For the more on-game plan legends, draw the Last Blood Chief, Shalai Dean of Radiance, and Nakira Lair Scavenger, whose repeatable reanimation, extra counter distribution, and counter payoff in the form of card advantage all working much better to keep our party intact, making them bigger and keeping our hands nice and full throughout the course of the game. And to wrap up our new clerical additions, we'll be swapping out the non-creature removal spells, Fridge's Retribution, D-Spark, and Crypt Swap, and exchanging them for Leon and Relic Warder, Fiend Hunter, and Banisher Priest, all of which are low-to-the-ground removal options on party members, which is exactly what we're looking for in this build. Proceeding to our warrior upgrades, we'll start off by swapping out the solid but two mana hungry Butcher of Malakir for the legend Lazeel Valakith's Champion, who hits the board much earlier than her predecessor and doubles the pace at which our commander and other counter distribution sources grow our board, making her a solid inclusion as both a party member and a counter payoff. The Rogue's Nighthawk Scavenger, Zulaport Cutthroat, and Mage's Attendant will then all get the axe, all of whom are solid but the fact that they're rogues hurting them as we already have a rogue in the command zone, and are instead replaced with Gutterbones, Tenacious Underdog, and Seasoned Hallow Blade, who are all resilient warriors thanks to their self-reanimation and indestructibility granting respectively, allowing them to swing in with impunity while still keeping our party intact to grow our board alongside our commander. Some warrior removal options are then slotted in to wrap up this category, with the solid non-creature spells Unbreakable Formation and Folk Hero, who can certainly remain in this build but we cut in this case to make room for more party members, and Mardu Strike Leader, whose token creation is nice but we have more than enough bodies in the main deck that it's not really necessary, all being cut to make room for Sigrid God Favored, Gatekeeper of Malakir, and Hidden Dragon Slayer, giving us another round of removal attached to party members to ensure our core stats are met despite being a creature-heavy build. Moving on to our new wizard entries, Magus of Balance, Dire Fleet Ravager, and Calculating Lich, whose mass land destruction, ETB life drain, and on attack life loss are a bit too niche for us to make full use out of in this build, are all exchanged out for Pain Seer, Keen Duelist, and Blood Tracker, all of which provide our build with additional card advantage that fit better with our aggressive playstyle, and whose life loss isn't too bad since we have sources of lifelink to help us get it back. The non-creature reanimation sources Savine's Reclamation and Dust to Dawn will then be cut in favor of more party-themed reanimation, that being Ezra the Awakener and Gissa Glorious Resurrector, the former letting us reanimate our party members an additional time as she swings in to keep our party intact or get extra uses out of our creature's abilities, while the latter hoses our opponent's graveyards and gets us extra temporary bodies to swing in with, which we can use to swing in for additional damage or take out blockers thanks to the death touch our commander grants them. Then quickly running down our last few wizard upgrades, Puppeteer Click's enemy reanimation will be swapped out for Jadar Ghoul Collar of Nephalia, who hits the board much faster and whose free token a turn works well with our commander's death touch granting to get in for extra damage or take blockers out. Gale Powder Mage and its flicker effect will be cut in favor of Viscopa Guild Mage, who can both pad our life totals with its targeted life gain and later turn that life gain along with other life gain sources into damage to help close out games. And the middling land Ash Barons will be cut to make room for Dream Stealer, who will either take out two blockers if blocked thanks to the combination of Menace and our commander's death touch, or instead rip cards out of our opponent's hands if it gets through. 
And finally, reaching our lone rogue upgrade, we'll be axing up planes in favor of Nazumi Grave Robber, who serves as a repeatable source of graveyard hate and, once it clears an opponent's graveyard, flips into Night Eyes the Desecrator, who has more powerful stats, becomes a wizard, and is a source of reanimation for both our opponents and our own creatures, making it well worth running despite being a rogue. Skipping over instant sorceries and enchantment upgrades since none were added to the core build, we reach our artifact upgrades and its lone entry, where we'll be swapping out the very powerful but not so good in this particular build Skull Clamp due to our lack of sack outlets, and adding in Wayfarer's Bobble in its place, giving us access to some decent ramp and fixing to both speed up our mana base and allow our commander to cast cards off the top for longer. And finally, reaching our land upgrades, we'll first cut the tap lands, Windbrisk Heights, Shambling Vent, Snowfield Sinkhole, and Orzhov Basilica, and replace them with Caves of Kolios, Shine Shadow Snarl, Fetid Heath, and Isolated Chapel. All of which usually come into play untapped to better fit with our more aggressive low-to-the-ground playstyle, as well as replacing the utility land, Mortuary Mire, for Bright Climb Pathway, giving us even more access to untapped lands and fixing. And lastly, we'll be removing Starlight Sanctum and adding in Karn's Bastion in its place, which fits better with our counter-focus game plan to grow all our creatures faster if we have the mana to spare. So, now that we've covered all 33 cards we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this pre-con upgrade. This deck currently has 55 creatures including the Commander, 0 Instants, 2 Sorceries, 1 Enchantment, 7 Artifacts, 0 Planeswalkers, and 35 Lands. Looking at the stats add matter to our game plan, we have 58 creatures that are either party members or can create tokens that are party members, 22 of which are clerics, 14 of which are warriors, 14 of which are wizards, 3 of which are rogues, and 6 of which which can be any. Along with them, we have 8 cards that care about the party mechanic, 9 sources of plus 1 plus 1 counters for themselves or others, 6 cards that care about plus 1 plus 1 counters, and 19 cards that either protect or reanimate themselves or others leaving us with a staggering amount of non-rogue party members to get a full party alongside our rogue commander and a decent number of payoffs for having a full party, additional sources of plus one plus one counters to work alongside our commander and payoffs for them, as well as plenty of ways to keep our party protected from removal and wipes or to bring them back should they be removed to keep the party together for as long as possible. For general deck stats, we have 10 ramp sources, 14 card draw sources, 8 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our draw being high since our mana curve is very low and we'll need to be able to draw into cards we can't cast off the top with our commander, while our removal is low since we're more concerned about protecting our creatures who our commander turns into removal when they swing in, with our ramp and board wipes falling within more normal numbers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 13 1 drops, 22 drops, 18 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 3 5 drops, and 1 6 drop giving us a very aggressive curve that aims to get our commander out quickly, using her as a source of card advantage to assemble our party off the top of our deck if we don't have them in hand already, and begin crashing into our opponents with our ever-growing and hard-to-block party members as soon as possible. The final price then comes out to be 74.20 after upgrades. This price does not include tax and assumes that the price you paid for the pre-con was $40. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, the non-creatures thwart the grave, coveted prize, and deadly alliance can be added in if we want to cut into our party base to add in some decent party payoffs, and the same goes for Felidar Retreat to add some additional counter distribution instead. For upgrades, Dranith Magistrate is a powerful wizard hate bear that can slow down our opponents significantly by preventing them from playing their commanders. Weathered Wayfarer is a rare form of land base ramp in our colors to help us piggyback off any green players to increase our land base, and Archivist of Ogma is another cheap and powerful cleric that turns any land ramp and tutors our opponents play into draw and life gain for us. And finally, Dark Confidants tops off our upgrades by being another cheap wizard that draws us cards turn after turn while also fulfilling our party requirements, though the life loss that draw costs us will pale in comparison to the amount of cash we'll have to pay to recruit him. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. With party time covered, the next precon upgrade we'll be covering will be Exit from Exile and its face commander, Faldorn Dreadwolf Herald, so look forward to an Exile-based wolf token build featuring her soon. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cut Raid Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.